Welcome to Barn Blog, and today we have Sam Kangaroo returning. And Sam is a modern monetary theory, uh, aka MMT subject matter expert, and an anarchist who has spent several years studying MMT and stress testing its validity through the challenges of the first and second wave of communities of modern monetary theorists, economic professionals. Um, and I think we've talked a little bit about the more recent history of that before. Um, you come out of uh, working uh, primarily with uh, Warren Mosler and his people. Um, you're also a fan of uh, Bill Mitchell um, and, you know, uh, Kelton, et cetera. But um, I think it's good that you point out that there are two waves there because there's also the like post Keynesian wave that was in about, was I think the more common framework I encountered of MMT from Minskyites uh, who were very sympathetic, um, who basically argued that uh, Keynesianism implied monetary theory, and they just wouldn't go and just admit that money was uh, a internal to the system creation. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but. Today we're going to focusing not so much on the history of MMT or even its general claims and validity. We're talking about, um, is it necessarily nationalist? I might even ask, um, does it even have to be methodologically nationalist? Although generally I will say yeah. it is. Um, and what are any revolutionary implications it might have that communist uh, may be interested in um, whether they was communist or Marxist or anarchist. Um, so this came in a debate with, with me when I uh, got really pissed off at uh, Fozzie. Um, I can't sure. Remember. Thomas yeah. Fozzie. Yeah. Thomas Fozzie. Um, um, over a series of events, uh, co-author of a book with Bill Mitchell. And I, unfairly and i will totally admit this is unfairly assumed that fozzy's position and Mitchell's position were the same because of their um their book on nationalism um and this also came out of some people pointing out uh an event where stephanie kelton had met with some people on the uh, on the political right in japan and so there was this kind of assertion made that MMT is necessarily nationalistic um, because of its methodological assumptions. Um, mm -hmm. And you really wanted to parse out those two claims and then talk about why, uh, you know, an anarchist like yourself or a Marxist like me may still be interested in the basic descriptive and maybe even some of the normative uh, prescriptions that MNT ec economist put out there. Um, so sure, let's yeah. let's let's talk about that. Yeah. So MMT is as nationalist inherently as a Haynes manual. And for those who don't know what the Haynes manual is, it's the preeminent sort of famous repair guide for your vehicle. Okay, that's <laughs> the Haynes manual. This is a really reliable repair guide for your car. But it's also an analysis of all of the components that go into it. So it's a repair manual, and it's also a here's how this works. And if it breaks, here's a way that you can fix it. Okay. So it's MMT is not any more nationalist than a Haynes manual. Now, I think the real question is does MMT, if its insights are accepted, lend itself to? a kind of nationalism, more so than other schools of economic economic thought. Are the logical outcomes or conclusions one might draw from the MMT framework necessarily nationalist responses to economic problems? Okay, that's what I think the real question needs to be. And to start that, the starting point for that question has to be well, what is the central insight of MMT? And the central insight is that the currency is nothing more than a public monopoly. That is fundamentally what the currency is. It's a, is a public monopoly 
And money is three things. It's a social unit of account. It is debt in and of itself. And it is a tax credit. So currency is nothing more than the state's money. It's the state form of money. That is currency. Okay. So if, if the currency is a public monopoly, then that means that the state has, by definition, to set the price. And it sets the price of the currency by what it's willing to pay for an hour of your time in order to provision itself. So I'm going to do the classic Mosler how to turn litter into money mm -hmm. exercise. We'll do it real quick. Okay, I'm in a room. There's however many thousands of people in the room. And I throw up my hand and say, anybody want this napkin? Uh, and everybody's kind of like, why would I want this napkin? And I say, well, anybody want to stay after the program and help clean up my apartment? And nobody's, you know, nobody's interested. So then I say, okay, look, you can't leave the room unless you get one of these napkins. And to get one of these napkins, you have to clean my apartment before you go. Um, and people will still say, well, uh, I'm still not interested. And then you say, well, you can't leave the room because I've got a guy with a nine millimeter at the door who won't let you leave if you try. Okay, so what's going on here? The guy with the nine millimeter at the door who won't let you leave the room without one of these napkins is the tax man, right? So if you live in the United States, it's the IRS. So who am I offering this piece of paper? I'm the central government. I'm the issuing authority of this, which is just litter until I told you that you needed one in order to leave the room. As soon as I tell you that in order to be able to leave the room, you need one, I just made you unemployed. You weren't unemployed before. You weren't looking for work that paid in the state's currency until I told you that you needed one in order to be able to continue on living with some semblance of liberty, right? Being able to leave mm -hmm. the room, okay? But until then, you weren't unemployed, you weren't employed, and you didn't need this, my currency. So it's the tax that drives the currency, okay? So the spending precedes the taxation. I spend and then I tax. I don't tax and then spend. So what happens if there's 5,000 people in the room? I only issue 4,950 of these, right? That means mm -hmm. 50 people aren't going to get one. And if everybody needs one in order to leave the room and 50 people don't get one, who are they? They're the people who can't find employment in the state's currency, right? So the system is in default. And this is what happens every time you have inadequate deficit spending, is that the system is in default. People are having to dip into savings in order to spend or rely on credit. And mm -hmm. we, can, we can cover some of this and all of the other areas that bracket out from this central insight. But for now, what I want to focus on is just having established that central insight, which is that the currency and its issuance is a public monopoly. We're all currency users. The state is a currency issuer. Okay. Mm -hmm. It sets the price of the currency. All right. So what that means in terms of nationalism, then I think there's a few things that we have to look at. One is and this is what Mitchell's point is. This is what Randy Ray's point is. When they talk about empowering the state, what they mean is with this information, the state has greater policy flexibility because it knows what the limits of its fiscal space really are, which are resource constraints. They're not revenue constraints. Mm -hmm. Okay, a, a political sovereign, meaning a nation state that has a floating exchange rate policy, issues its own currency, denominates debt only in its own currency, has the maximum possible fiscal space relative to its resources. It's gonna get the most bang for its buck in terms of resource utilization. Now, a country that has a fixed rate system, China has a fixed rate system, but still manages to be what MMTers call highly monetarily sovereign. And again, that's based on those criteria that I mentioned. So it's, do you 
do you issue debt in any in currencies other than your own? Do you denominate debt in any currency that you don't issue? That's one factor. The other is, do you tax only in your own currency? That's another factor. Um, is your currency fixed to any other currency or to a commodity? So are you bound by gold? Is your currency fixed? Do you have, are you on a gold standard or a silver standard or any other commodity standard? Um, are you fixed to another currency? Because if so, then you always have to have enough of that thing that your currency is fixed to in reserve in order to be able to spend. So we're going to set up the Republic of Varn. It's day one. You issue 100 Varns into your economy, your mm -hmm. newfound uh, nation. So you issue 100 units of Varn. And you say that, okay, every every Varn is going to be worth a unit of gold, and that's what's going to back the currency. You have 100 units of gold to back it, no problem. But now let's say you want to issue another 100, okay? What are your options? Your options are go dig up another 100 units of gold before you spend. Otherwise, you can't spend it because you're promising to redeem a Varn for a unit of gold, whatever number of ounces that might be. We're going to call it a unit, right? So each mm -hmm. unit of barn is good for a unit of gold and however many ounces it's established in this republic that a unit of barn will be worth in gold, okay? Um, but if you don't have it, you can't spend unless you do one of a number of things. You either go dig up more gold and now you can spend that, ex that second hundred units of barns, your currency, mm -hmm. into your country, or... You can do what? You can tax. You can say, well, <laughs> I want to spend another hundred, but like I don't want to spend the resources or I don't have the time to go and dig up that gold. Or I don't want to move those resources to being gold because I really need them doing these other things that our economy relies on. And to have them go dig up gold just so I can spend more paper um, is a waste of those resources. So maybe you're reluctant to go dig up more gold, or maybe you're running out of gold, whatever the issue might be. So you can tax instead. This is also like got its own problems, right? Like first of mm -hmm. all, it's politically very unpopular, right? And second of all, you're constantly having to drain the reserves of people's savings, right? It's called a reserve drain. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what tax saving is, is it drains reserves from the system. And so you're draining these reserves only to then turn around and, and spend them again. So in a fixed rate exchange system, taxes can function to finance some spending because if you're taxing the purpose of I've run out of the thing that's backing my currency and now need to tax in order to spend, then taxation in those cases really does finance government spending. There's also instances when the currency is fixed to a commodity or another currency where the taxation doesn't function to finance government spending. So you could be on a fixed exchange rate system, but you have plenty of reserves to finance your new spending. So then what are you taxing for in that case? Well, in that case, you're taxing for the same reason that you tax in a fiat system, in a floating exchange rate system like the one that the United States and most of the core economies in the world um, are in, um, and that is to mitigate inflation in part, that's one reason, and to drive the currency. And also for social engineering purposes, you're changing the distribution of wealth in the society through taxation. Um, and but primarily, MMT would say you're driving the currency. You're creating the impetus for the currency by taxing in the first place. And so that story goes like this, which is that, OK, as I said in the litter, how to turn litter into the money example or currency example. Um, none of these folks were unemployed until the tax was imposed. As soon as the tax is, the tax is imposed, now you're looking for work. Well, why does the government do this? This is like obviously highly coercive. Um, and the government does this in order to get you to confer legitimacy onto it. Now, what does that mean? And how does that possibly make sense here? Well, you elected this government and it's got to build roads, bridges, trains, uh, you know, whatever it needs in order to run a functioning state. It has to provision itself in order to do that, which means it has to move resources from the private sector to 
working for the public sector in order to get the things that you expect of it built. Um, and so the best way for it to do that is to say, is to levy a tax that's payable only in the currency that it issues. So now you're essentially having to go to work for the state um, in order to get the, in order for the state to provision itself. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what does this have to do with nationalism? Well, a fiscal authority having this information is very empowering for that fiscal authority. It now realizes that it can, when it's more prudent to spend and when it's not, how to potentially mitigate all recessions. I mean, I think MMT economists would quietly at this point tell you that they believe that they can actually mitigate every recession. <laughs> all recessionary pressures can be mitigated through an understanding of MMT. Now, what they will also say, and this is important to keep in mind, is that once a recession takes hold or once inflation takes hold, it's much harder to stop and to mitigate after it's already taken hold. In other words, it's, it's much easier to prevent a recession or a period of prolonged inflation um, than it is to stop it once it's already kicked in. And that seems to be because of the pro-cyclical nature of capitalism. Like during boom periods, like they just go, like they hit the overdrive button. And then during pullbacks, like they smash the e-brake up as hard as they possibly can. And that's really natural capitalism. This is the business cycle. And this is something that Marx talked about. We know that this is how it works. Um, Unfortunately, like Marx missed a, a number of things also that, that MMT comes in to clear up, but that some of his immediate disciples, like um, Kalecki and Rosa Luxemburg, got right. Um, to give an example of one now, it's investment as a function of demand. That really what causes investment by the private sector and government spending is the level of demand that there is. So and when we talk about investment in terms of real economics, we're talking about investment in land, labor, and capital. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Amazon is not going to hire more workers. It's not going to order more machines, and it's not going to lease more land if it doesn't think it can make a profit. And sales are what run that. Sales are what drive capitalism. Or profits are what drive capitalism, but what drives profits is sales. And this is the important thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, certainly, parliaments will be empowered by this understanding. Um, it doesn't mean that they have to use it. And we can talk a little bit more about that later on as well. And why I think that even in the United, that in the United States, if even the likes of the Biden administration fully understood MMT, we would never get single payer health care out of them. Um, ever. I mean, they could, if tomorrow they accepted this all, totally and utterly what the MMT economists are arguing, um, I still think we would not have all of these things that we could afford. And I'll leave that as kind of a cliffhanger to talk about later, but we can, we can come back to it. Um, so talking about recent governments throughout history of a nationalist bent that have utilized um, what we would call now MM insights, the Third Reich is actually a really good example. So Hitler figured out, he had some essays on economic writings. And what's interesting, by the way, is there's a connection here to Donald Trump and what Donald Trump's understanding of the currency is, the public monopoly is. But um, Hitler thought about this a lot. And he came to the conclusion correctly that like, the paper that the government issues must just be a simple public monopoly. Like Hitler came to this on his own hmm. after thinking about it and he wrote about it. And that's how he got Germany out of uh, its, its depression. And it's how he created a full employment economy is that he realized that, oh, okay, uh, this is a simple public monopoly. And then he went further to write about how the constraints couldn't possibly be the quantity of money issued they have to be the resources available to absorb that spending. So that what he's talking about without even maybe realizing it when he wrote it is where their inflationary pressure are. It's not the quantity of money itself. And by the way, nobody at the Federal Reserve today <laughs> believes in the quantity theory of money. Even they don't buy it. So it has nothing to do with like how much units of currency there actually are in the economy as to how much inflation you're going to get. Well, why is that? That's because inflation comes from three 
different sources. There's demand pull inflation, there's mm -hmm. cost inflation, and there's sectoral inflation. So demand pull inflation is you have greater demand for goods and services, but the pro there's the productive output to meet that increased demand doesn't exist. And there isn't enough slack in land, labor, and capital, which is also known as excess capacity. There isn't enough excess capacity. So what's excess capacity? Let's go through them for each of the factors of production. Excess capacity in labor is unemployment. So yep. there, isn't, there isn't enough unemployment to absorb the new spending. Okay, potential inflationary pressure. All right, there isn't enough land available for, or for zoning for commercial use to absorb the new spending. Okay, potential cause of inflationary pressure. Um, there isn't enough, or there aren't efficient enough machines to absorb new government spending. Okay, potential area of uh, point of inflationary pressure. If you increase demand through new spending, that then you don't have the resources to absorb. It turns out though, that it's actually really difficult to create demand pull inflation is really difficult and we don't most of the cases of serious inflation that we see around the world um have been supply side they've been cost push they haven't mm -hmm. been pull because there's so many ways to alleviate demand pull inflationary pressure if you don't have enough labor you immigration is an option if you don't have enough land you can do all kinds of things with rezoning. If you don't have enough capital machinery, you can import the technology, let's say that you need for faster machines. So you have options to increase capacity. The other thing that you can do if you issue new spending and you don't really have a way of increasing capacity and you've hit all your resource limits is you can tax. So you can drain reserves and that's what taxation does. That's not the preferred way to mitigate demand pull inflation. You'd have to really look at other areas where you might be able to cut spending in certain areas in order to offset the new spending that you're doing. So there is like still trade-offs. Uh, it just means though that you're not waiting on rich people to fork over the dollars before you can spend. That's not how it works at no point do the taxes function to finance government spending? Um, then with cost push inflation, this is, you have some sort of supply side issue. The best example of this is the 1970s, early to mid seventies with the OPEC crisis. That was OPEC raising prices. Now we have to talk about this because this is going on right now. And everybody thinks that if they, if we could just get OPEC to produce more barrels of oil, the price of energy would come down. No. <laughs> This is, this is wrong. I'm sorry. Nothing could be further from the truth. Why? Because OPEC is a monopoly, which just like the U.S. government with its currency or any other country that has control over its own currency, they are the price setter. They're not a price taker. They're a price giver. Okay. They give a price. They make a price the same way that the U.S. government does with the dollar when it issues it. And governments do it by what they spend at the point at which they spend. So in other words, when the government spends, how much it spends sets a reference point for the rest of the market and for all other market prices. I get into that in a little bit more detail later. Too. But um, to go back to what I was saying with OPEC, OPEC could quadruple the number of barrels of oil that it produces. And as long as it's charging the same price that it's currently charging, Nothing changes, nothing changes. So how do you deal with a problem like that? Well, you have to invest in other forms of energy. This is a market problem. So as long as you're dependent on markets for meeting energy needs, like you're gonna run into this problem, especially when a, a significant, but not the overwhelming majority. And this is the other thing Americans need to understand is that the greatest single source of energy for the United States actually comes from the United States itself. But yep. In aggregate, if you take if you look at aggregates, like if you were to aggregate all sources of energy, then yes, the foreign sector combined is makes up a greater portion of our our energy um, sourcing than our domestic. But when you look at any individual source, our domestic supply is actually the largest single source. Um, 
So we're not as dependent, you know, we're, we're, we're dependent on foreign oil in the aggregate, but it's we're not that like really dependent on any one single source. The, if we stopped importing from OPEC, then we would have to make that production up somewhere else. That mm -hmm. is true. And so we can either make it up by transitional energy projects here at home, or we're going to have to find somebody else to sell us more oil, or we're going to have to tap into strategic reserves. But this is a problem of a monopoly power controlling the price. It's not a production problem. It only becomes a production problem when you have competitive markets. OPEC is not a competitive market. So what this further does for somebody like me, and I can already like hear the audience going, so wait, why are you an anarchist? I don't understand. Or why, <laughs> why are you, like, how is this possible that you're an anarchist and an anarchist? Um, because one of the things that this does is it shines a light on, or it should for people, that capitalism is not the economy. Capitalism is a feature of the economy. And that's a political choice that's enshrined by loss. Like we've decided to have a system of government where uh, the private sector and the political power have this sort of symbiotic relationship um, and rely and depend on one, on one another for power. Uh, and this is also where some of my criticisms of like political economy from the MMTers comes in. The MMT, and, and these are all, many of them economists that I, whose work I absolutely respect um, and their, whose ideologies, political ideologies, some of whom I appreciate, some of whom are different than mine, but whose econ is still useful regardless of how aligned we are ideologically. And, and the reason for that is because MMT is just as true for a liberal as it is a conservative, as it is for a progressive, as it is, as it is for a Trumper, just as true for a fascist as it is um, for a socialist, uh, is that a lot of them are, are basically like market socialists. And, and it's really interesting, like somewhat crypto, but if you're really paying attention, like not so crypto market socialists uh, mm -hmm. in, their, in their political arrangements and ideologies. And there seems to be, although I haven't gone yet totally full force in confronting them all about this, and it's my next step, I think, in, in talking to the MMT academic world, is that do you think, this would be me addressing them, that if Joe Biden fully accepted the tenets of modern monetary theory, that then he would turn around and say, well, gee, since it turns out we can afford, say, single-payer health care, um, I'm all for it now. Uh, I think a lot of them probably would say, well, yeah, right? Because then the one thing that they've always claimed is the thing. And that's really threatening to power, by the way. And that's where I think MMT has this revolutionary potential is if the general public do this to the point where the power structure could no longer deny it, right? Mm -hmm. What are they, they going to say? Like that excuse is off the table. If, the, if Biden or whoever it is and who it is is almost inconsequential at this point because they all subscribe to a sort of the last however many presidents a neoliberal paradigm based on monetarism and they have literally all of the economic operations of our economy backwards literally backwards um but if you came to realize that okay this is actually the way it works these guys have a point they're empirically correct can be validated yep makes sense would he then turn around and do all of these things that it turns out we can afford to do? My answer is he would not. Why? And I, the reason why is because of class. Mm -hmm. it, still, it still behooves him to stay in a power of domination and hierarchy over those who are outside of his class. And most of the people in political power are of the same class that Joe Biden is in. And so there's really no incentive for him to have his power threatened and the power of those whom he represents with shared class interests. So I don't think that Joe Biden would, if he accepted MMT tomorrow, um, decide, okay, here's single payer health care, here's a Green New Deal, here is you know six months of paternity leave and paternity leave. 
uh, and on and on and on, and all of these sort of progressive reforms. I don't think that would happen. And if it doesn't happen, it strips away this veil of, well, if only for affordability, we'd love to do these things, but it's not financially prudent. It's ir fiscally irresponsible. If it turns out that it's not any of those things, then what is he going to say? There's nothing left for him to say other than, well, <laughs> this isn't Europe. Like, that's it. That's it. Like, that's just not the way we think of things here in America. And that puts them in an incredibly vulnerable situation because I think the population at large then defaults to, well, okay, clearly this is so that you can maintain a position of authority over the rest of us to and maintain and keep us in a state of precarity um, economically, socially uh, precarity. And so that's where that's one of the the challenges and criticisms I have of kind of the political arms of MMT that are out there. And they're not all the same to be sure. Uh, but I think a lot of those first wave economists um, Scott Fulweiler, I would put as kind of like maybe wave 1.5, mm -hmm. uh, him and Fadl Kaboob, but they're, they're like definitely market socialists, like not so crypto. And I'm not saying that as a criticism, but it's kind of a matter of what I think is fact. And mm -hmm. I think that the case for like Warren also strikes me as a market socialist because he talks about how like, you know, it's only... It, for an understanding of what MMT has to say, we would be able to reduce all kinds of honest, otherwise unnecessary suffering. And I think that's true, but that doesn't change the fact that if the more dominant a feature of capitalism is of an economy, the more dominant a feature it is, I think the less likely you are to see MMTs, the kinds of policy um, outgrowths that could come from MMT insights be implemented. Um, and that's certainly going to be true across the board. So where I think there's a, where that means there's opportunity is um, no, I in. Not I, I, okay. <laughs> what I, I mean, I'm in a common area. And I just got invaded by some children <laughs> walking by. Keep going. Okay, great. All um, right. <laughs> anyway, um, so where I think that, that offers. Um, some real opportunity uh, the political will compared to where this could be done in service of the public good are places like Brazil and Chile. So if you look, if you were to bring this to Lula, then yes, absolutely, I think you could expect to see fiscal space. Um, did that kid, did that kid moon the screen? I turned around and I felt like this kid just like, anyway. Um, where, where, I turned around and like, he's, he's like mooning. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it's like perfect timing based on, yeah, the American economic fight, right. So, um, and you could also probably take this to Boric in Chile and say, look, knowing this, you don't have to be personal in, in, in terms of your spending. The IMF is wrong. They're making you pro-cyclical for no good reason. Um, you have an ability with in total affordability to have a full employment economy, a 0% interest rate, um, and use your existing foreign reserves to pay off your Euro and US denominated debt. So you're debt denominated in foreign currencies, pay that off with reserves from exports, move to a zero interest rate um, and uh, institute a, a full employment uh, program or policy. Uh, and then you can also, you'll have room to spend more on investments in education and healthcare. You can, you can sell that to those politicians who sort of lean socialist or might even have real socialist bona fides. Uh, and probably get them to move on it. I don't think you can get that out of the American political system. So again, it's really a matter of what the ideology in power wants to do, if anything, with the information. Here in the US, the information is especially dangerous to the existing power structure because it means that all of these things that they've been telling us for decades, we can't have because we can't afford it, we can afford. <laughs> 
Well, uh, my my only caveat to what you just pointed out there, and, and and it's not it doesn't contradict anything you said. It's it's if you're a nation who is not highly productive, um, there's going to be more you have to buy on a competitive market on the world scale. Um, what I think I think about Brazil is, uh, despite it being in a, a you know a, a quote middle income country, um, that it is a a it has a huge productive economy actually relative uh, to most of the rest of Latin America. And, and no, it's not the size of the U S not the size of China, not the size of Europe combined, but it's larger than many European nations that could have currency cut, could pull off currency sovereignty if they wanted to. Um, and on that, I would not disagree. Um, I think, I think that key point though, about, I think the question becomes um, maybe we slightly disagree is while I agree with you that the, the key issue is the ideology of power. Right. And so where, um, where in the United States, I've always just said like, yeah, okay, let's just assume that MMT conditions are true. The normative policies you're prescribing are still not going to happen. Right. I've always, I've always just said that. And I'm like, because, uh, labor discipline here would go immediately to shit. Um, and other countries, you get more of that. Although we will note that politicians, even quote nominally socialist politicians, do claw that back. And and why they claw it back is generally not because of the need to get revenues. That's almost never the case. It's usually because some <laughs> capitalists are complaining about. Uh, competitive market share which is usually a code for we want more productivity and to get more productivity we have to be able to command workers to do more shit and how do you command people to do more stuff you make it more precarious um yeah you know uh well that's that, one that's that's one way to do it right well what's it, let's go with the other it. ways yeah. <laughs> yeah well yeah although i will say the scandinavians are known for doing stuff like freezing wages to to quote flight inflation like they do that like um and that created a lot of bad blood towards the various socialist parties in those countries and that's why you have periodic right-wing outbreaks there that and xenophobia um although i would also point out that the and this is to this is not to contradict you at all but that in these countries when you do have these right-wing um like spasms uh you you might have some calling back of some labor stuff but mmt conditions as described definitely still apply they're still spending um pretty much whatever they need to to maintain some sort of social safety nets it's where that's at and what that is being spent on is what changes usually um and that's also complicated now after the establishment of the eurozone by the that constitutional rule that treats money like gold um which is that's i mean even i think that's a ridiculous constraint that i don't know why they did except to mollify german central bankers um but that's you know those are the those are the limits at hand so again not disagreeing what you say i think actually we're still lining up an analysis um the the question that I have right now is that um, you talk about this as a revolutionary strategy. And I think, you know, I remember I was talking to, I believe, Max Seho uh, over there at mm -hmm. um, um, Money in the Left. Money and I said, left, yeah. I said, look, you know, I could get behind um, a, a radical demand that MMT makes that you guys really want, which is the employment guarantee. And I do think it is fiscally possible. I do not for a minute think it is politically possible. And well, not in the United States anyway. Right. Um, well, why do you why do you think it's not politically possible? Maybe we don't think it's politically possible for different reasons. I don't just think it's ideology. I mean, I think it I think it would the, the amount of class that the amount of um power that would cede to uh to elements of the would seat away from elements of the capitalist class would risk their rule in general. Like, um, 
And that's something that I think is somewhat, I think that's why they're so strict on it here in particular, well, because we do have, we do have the material wealth. That's the thing. There are other countries that have more, that we're talking about that live more material abundant lives. You do not have, and by material wealth, I'm not referring to revenue flows or any of that. I mean, the productive capacity and physical stuff, right. you know, we're a quite large nation. Like right. we, you know, even without all the imperial nonsense, we're a quite large nation. Like there's, there is, I mean, theoretically, if we weren't interested in trading energy on the open market, we could be energy independent now. Like that is a possibility. We have, um, we don't do that for a variety of reasons. The, and what does that have to do with employment? Well, there's like a lot of this to me seems like there are like, for example, there's if we think of money as a power relationship, and you know your initial, um, you know the 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 uh, Kanep statement is basically, you know, money is a public monopoly. Public monopolies are usually enforced by some kind of power relationship. Um, power relationship can come from any number of places. It, you know, we're not talking about the nature of that. It's just it is that. Um, And the, and then we look at this and go, okay, well, that's, that's a possibility. That's, that seems true. We, we realize that uh, governments don't go bankrupt when they, when they print more money, they don't always have, but they generally don't have inflation when they print more money. That tends to be tied to some other event. Um, I tend to think like you that, uh, that the man pool inflation is really fucking rare. Um, but, and that quantity in the quantity theory of money, just, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of evidence for it at all. Like if you like map it out on a chart, it starts looking like, like the curve that it's supposed to go on just looks insane. When you actually like do the real yep. mapping. Um, and you also can see very quickly that even in a even in a very capitalist society, the moment you start reducing deficits at the at the quote national level, so at the issuer of monopoly money, not in the terms of states, um, you will immediately have uh, liquidity crises. It's just automatically, people will start draining your their reserves, just like you say. And we see this now. I mean, um, savings has you know, we had a mild recovery of savings during COVID. It's all gone now. And people are now even at higher interest costs, accumulating more debt. And frankly, if that was why we were having inflation, it should take care of it. I also think that, that the Fed targeting employment specifically is, it's definitely proof, as you said, that they don't actually believe quantity theory of money because the way that they traditionally explain that was that raising interest rates would entice savings? Savings would remove money from the from the over hot market into reserves. Those could be slowly reinvested. That's not true. Like right. we like that is the seventies and eighties proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's not what it does. Right. Um, at, at no bank is raising their savings account. Uh interests of any significance right now i mean it, so that's just a fundamentally untrue assertion and they know that and they don't say it anymore so then they're like well okay let's try to hurt labor now i've been what you know quietly talking to you and oh and a lot of marxists too like part of me is like they really must care about this power differential because it, this is risking collapsing the economy to, to because we already have inelasticity in labor and um, yes, they could fix it very easily by changing immigration law again. Um, that's that's an easy fix. Fareed Zakaria is not wrong about that, but they're not doing that. Um, so what's the purpose then of trying to, you know, raise interest specifically to take aim at at unemployment? Well, right? the yeah. So a couple things there. One is that. Um, as you know, the idea behind raising the rates is that it will deter people from borrowing and that will cool 
uh, inflationary pressure. Um, the problem with that, there are lots of problems with it. One is that interest is an interest that is set by the federal government. So what they do is they set the number and then they buy and sell bonds. They issue bonds at different rates of interest in order to hit that interest rate target. So there's what the Fed says, which is what you hear on the news, like we're going to raise interest rates however many points. And then in order to actually achieve that new rate, they have to go into the bond market and buy and sell bonds in order to hit that rate. So it's not like an act of God where they declare it and by declaration it's true. They have to then manipulate the actual bond market in order to hit that rate. So when you hear about this huge national debt that we have, it's actually the issuance of all of these bonds, which are dollar for dollar matching all spending that's occurred since 1786, which is when the country was founded, or whatever year for whatever country you're examining. Okay, it is national debt is the cumulative of all budget deficits and surpluses that country has ever run, that political sovereign has ever run. So our national debt in the United States, that number that you always hear about, that astronomical number, is all of the budget deficits that we've accumulated minus all of the budget surpluses the country has run, which has been very few over its history, uh, which then yield that number that you know of as national debt, which is actually the national net savings of the private sector. The government's deficit is the private sector's surplus to the penny. The government's national, so-called national debt is the national savings. That is all of the budget. It's the cumulative private sector surpluses since 1786. So when you, to take the Republic of Varn exercise again, when you spend 100 units into its year one, you spend 100 units of your currency, Varns, into existence, do you have 100 less Varns to spend into existence because you just spent 100? Do you have 100 more? Do you have 300 more? Do you have 1,000 less? Like, no, you're, this is just you being scorekeeper. You don't have... Varns, you spend them into existence. You neither have them nor don't have them. And this is more than just some sort of philosophical way to look at it. It's logically correct. It's like if we're playing a card game and I'm the scorekeeper, like, and I give you 10 points, do I have 10 points less to give to somebody else? No. When they score 10 points, I just write down Bill, 10 points, Varn, 10 points. That's it. So the Federal Reserve is just a scorekeeper of the economy. That's all they do. It's just an accounting game. And when you realize that, it also really makes you think about like, okay, well, what are my constraints? And as we talked about earlier, those constraints are really resource constraints because it doesn't mean through this realization, this understanding that there is no constraint in spending. That's not what we're saying. We've never said that. What we offer actually through this understanding, we think is a much more sophisticated analysis of what actually causes inflation than any of the pre-existing schools of economic thought to this point. Um, that Keynesianism in particular, and even Neo-Keynesianism in their belief in a uh, limited quantity of the loanable, it's called the loanable, loanable funds theory, we think this theory is totally invalid. This theory states that essentially there's only so much money out there that can be loaned at any given time because banks loan from reserves. Well, banks don't loan from reserves. <laughs> this is the problem. Like you have to understand that everybody, almost everybody going to school for economics is taught this stuff. And it's, it's just flat wrong. Like when I go 
money gets into the system in two ways when the government spends. One is the government, and this is true of all governments in the world. I don't care how monetarily sovereign or not they are. Okay, and that's why you'll also hear folks like Warren Mosler doesn't talk about any of this in terms of. Um, monetary sovereignty. He doesn't use a scale of monetary sovereignty because he thinks that, and he's not necessarily wrong here, it's just a different way to look at it, that you can sort of customize a set of insights based around MMT's framework for any individual case. I think that's true. Uh, Scott Fulweiler and Fadal Kaboob on the, the Kaboob, on the other hand, um, look at a scale of monetary sovereignty based on criteria as a useful metric for determining um, what it is, what kind of public mission that society should be aiming for in terms of its uh, economy and how evolved and self-determining its economy is. So that if they want to reach a place where they have maximum fiscal policy space, um, it's good to be able to grade on some kind of scale how monetarily sovereign you are. And I don't come down hard, Varn, uh, on either one of these. I don't come down hard in one camp or another on using that scale. I think you can use it and it has some usefulness. I also think that you can completely ignore it uh, if you wanted to and just focus on what things for the current moment in each economy make sense to do toward um, achieving what all economics is, is striving to achieve, and that's full employment with price stability, okay? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, where was I? I have to circle back. Oh, yeah, but we were circling back to, to why I didn't, I was, I agreed with you on why this won't happen, and I said, uh, I also see capitalist powers um, uh, uh, do that in a lot of other, economies that do have some of the things that that it seems like we would be able to get and they're even you know one of the things that i that i do like point out that the u.s medicine system for example is is inordinately expensive like that's not like it's efficiency or lack or it's, uh, or it's, it's open marketness or lack and and the u.s medical system doesn't really work like an open market uh, even the way that open markets are described by normal capitalist because there's no price transparency at all um you have to agree to services before price um right. w which which is not how a market is supposed right. to work um, right. um right. uh so uh, well, that brings us to pipe that brings us to the question of price gouging mm -hmm. and so one of the things that i would like to see the, MM, the MMT economists, the MMT community, almost across the board, including those who might acknowledge this reluctantly or begrudgingly, um, will accept that price gouging is playing some sort of factor, is playing a factor to some degree in the current elevated price level as compared to pre-COVID. What I want people to really take away from in terms of inflation pre versus post-COVID um, is that it was not all of the quote-unquote free stuff that they got during COVID that caused the inflation. Yes, there was some pent-up demand as a result of businesses, by and large, being many of them closed during the, the height of the, we'll say, the policy aspects of the pandemic. Um, the biological question is... is sort of completely separate and doesn't always correlate well with when restrictions were in place and when they weren't. Um, not all of that is actually, as we know, aligned with the epidemiology of the virus. But anyway, um, insofar as the point in which businesses were most shuttered, um, that period there were all of the so-called stimulus checks. There weren't stimulus checks, the, the unemployment extensions, the pandemic money, all of that was really survival money. And also to ensure that there would be sufficient uh, demand when those restrictions on businesses being closed were lifted. And it worked, like you lifted restrictions, there was pent up demand. I describe it as like a black 
Friday type situation where everyone is pressed up against the door of the Best Buy and then all of a sudden the doors open and they all fall through, right? That's what happened with the pandemic. That's what we mean by pent up demand. So there was this pent up demand, doors open, everybody falls through at once. That's going to cause an upward price bias. Totally natural. And then it fizzles out. And that's what it did. <laughs> it fizzled out. So what made the price level continue to rise after that point? And what MMP says is that we look at the supply side. We see that, yes, there is war going on that affect, affected food prices, affected energy prices. We also see OPEC using their price setting power to raise the price of oil. Um, some of that may be political, but a lot of it is simply taking advantage of a period when there is a shortage, um, there's a supply shock somewhere in the system. That is the most opportune time for a monopolist of that good to come in and gouge because it's like, okay, you've lost one of your sources of revenue. Well, you're going to need more from us. Well, we're going to just increase the price. Uh, and that's what happens when you're buying a mono from a monopolist. Of course, we wouldn't have to worry about any of this if we didn't have capitalism. But let's talk more about it as we go along here. Um, and that's true. And, and that's how you end up with this inflationary situation is plus all of the supply chain shocks as a result of COVID. We were really big into just-in-time manufacturing before the pandemic, which is good. I support that. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, I think it reduces waste, but also uh, if you run into a, a, this kind of atypical situation where production all of a sudden comes to a halt, um, then reliance on just-in-time manufacturing means that when you come off of that halt, things are not going to be ready just in time anymore. <laughs> There's going to be a backlog and um, if you don't have the machine capacity to deal with that backlog because you switched uh, to just-in-time manufacturing, then there's going to be shortages. There's going to be shortages as a, as, a, as a result of your supply chain and as a result of a manufacturing, as I mentioned, productivity glut and, and backlog. Um, it's just a clog in the pipes. It's really a, a good way to look at it. And so the government can can target those those clogs. It has to identify them first. Like it has to be willing to investigate them. It has to identify them, and then it has to spend money on them. So how do I know right now that we're not adequately? How do I know, and how do all MMTers know that we're not adequately deficit spending right now? Because the most obvious evidence for that, as MMT demonstrates, is unemployment. I know we're not deficit spending enough because there's still unemployment. And in fact, what we see in the Biden administration is exactly what I predicted last time I was on your show, which is that they would turn into deficit hawks and they would continue to try and run uh, at least a balanced budget, if not a budget surplus, and that this would force the economy to rely more on credit. Now watch this, if you have demand, okay, at a certain level, and then that demand in order to maintain that level requires a certain amount of money spent into the economy by the currency issuer. If that money doesn't get spent, people have to look elsewhere to satisfy or to realize that demand. So where are they gonna go? They're going to go to credit cards. They're going to go to loans. Right? And that's all backed up right now. Credit cards and loans are, despite the fact interest rates have increased and despite the fact the cost of borrowing is higher, credit card, personal credit card use has increased. gone up. Yes. And at some point, if incomes are not high enough to maintain those levels of debt, that's when you get a bubble. Now, right now, the service, and you can check this out from the Fed's website. They have wonderful charts on this. Loan servicing is actually totally solvent right now. Like the, the private sector is doing a good job of servicing loans, meaning they're, they're paying their credit on time. That's what that means when we talk about loans mm -hmm. being serviced. So 
servicing uh, loan service is servicing is solvent. Um, but that's not sustainable because if people continue to have continue to have to rely on credit because there aren't enough federal dollars being spent in order to, for them to maintain the levels of demand that they want, then you end up with a bubble. And the only way, and the other thing is that the Fed at a time when people are more and more relying on credit is actually raising interest rates to make this even more dangerous a situation. Um, what happened under the Clinton years and what led to the dot-com bust was that Clinton ran a budget surplus. Now, he was at least good enough to run very low interest rates while running this budget surplus because little did he know and little did his administration know that, yes, people were having to rely more and more on credit. Um, that's not the reason why he made interest rates so low. He just thought that that would be a good stimulus for the economy, so he made them low. Um, it's a good thing that they were low because if they hadn't been, uh, people, the bubble would have been much bigger. People would have not been able to service their debt all that much more uh, than they already turned out not to be able to by the time the year 2000 comes around and you have the dot com boom, uh, and then the dot com bust. All right. So you and I are all competing for a certain amount of money. The money from the federal government is not money that has to be paid back. When the federal government spends, it spends with either a transfer payment to something like Social Security or unemployment insurance, or it does business with someone in the private sector. Those are the only ways that money gets into the economy. People need to understand this. This is just a fact. I'm sorry, Marxists. Uh, Microsoft does not have a printing press. So the government is doing business with a business who is then doing business with a business, who is then doing business with a business, who is then on and on and on and on. The first person to get the money is in a privileged position. Why? Because if you're the Republic of Varn and the first hand that the money that you spend into existence is at the same corporation, I'm so sorry about the background noise. I really, yes, yeah, the same corporation. You have a legislature with it's $100 million into existence on some project, whatever. It's making widgets, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, you have two choices. You, the government, this is just true of every political sovereign that has ever existed in all of human history. In any modern sense, this is what your options are. You can either go and make the widgets yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So these are the Republic of Arms widgets. You can be the Soviet Union and see how that goes. Or you can pay a private sector firm to make the widgets for you, or you can enter into some kind of public-private partnership with the private sector firm um, to make the widgets, right? Those are your three options. So let's say you hire the same corporation, you're gonna contract me for the 100 mil on widget making. This was all appropriated by Congress. They hold the fiscal purse strings in the United States. It's mostly parliaments in every country in the world that have the fiscal authority to what to spend, what to spend on, how much to spend. Now that's all supposed to be based on public mission. So that really what we're spending money on is supposed to be a reflection of the values of the society. And once we know how much we can spend, what we choose to spend on, then becomes a reflection of the values of the society. So hundred million dollars coming to me now, oh, I might have to contract out with multiple firms who then have to contract out with multiple firms in order to get these widgets made for you. And even if I don't, I'm still a business that in other parts of my business, I was going to be doing business with other businesses. But the fact that I am the first stop in this filter of money into the private sector means that I'm going to get the lion's share of it. I'm going to get the lion's share of it. So companies, corporations who are doing business with the government are in a privileged position because they are going to see the lion's share of that money that then filters down through other companies who are doing business with that company. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense. So, so, I mean, with those constraints, I mean, I mean, 
where does that lead you to next? So I think where that leads you to next is understanding, okay, I have this much fiscal space. These are the resources available to me. Now, why won't my government act? Well, my government won't act because, A, it is bought into this ideology of austerity that says I have to raise taxes, reduce deficit spending, um, keep as balanced a budget as possible, and be careful of how many bonds I issue even in my own currency uh, because I don't want to crowd out private sector investment and deficit spending crowds out private sector investment, right? That's their narrative. And nothing mm -hmm. could be further from the truth. And it's so, it's so pernicious that it leads to situations where you can have um, full employment and deflation uh, massive unemployment and inflation like that is all entirely possible under the ideological if you're running an economy using the ideological framework or lens of like a neoclassical model a monetarist model where they're focused on quantity um, theory of money uh, or even if not quantity theory of money still at least between the uh, interest rates as a way to control the money supply. And so the other thing that like guys like Paul Krugman are, you're going to hear, think, or at least will still claim publicly, even though guys like Mosler privately um, will say that he doesn't believe this any longer, that he's come to the private leagues, it's all of MMT, but that publicly, um, uh, he will. Con he's continuing to uh, toot the same horn, which you know we think is clearly because of careerist interests of his. Um, it's a threat to him and his influence to now have to turn around and say it turns out that these MMB guys were were right all along about uh, these things. That's not a good look for him, and is a threat to his his power. And influence, especially over Washington policymakers. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that I, I, have, I was going to ask you because ten years ago he was actually closer to MMTers on his policy advocacy, and now he sounds like Larry Summers. So yeah, I think that as he's, <laughs> I just don't know what's going on. Um, I'm getting ready to like get up and like go have the chat to see why and it keeps happening. They just assist the random folks in the building um, to use the stairs instead of the elevator. But it's okay. Some neighbors kids. Uh, what what happens with with guys like this and Krugman knows that this is the case. How do we know that? Because he met with Warren in the Virgin Islands. They went out to dinner including their wives and at one point Krugman interrupted Mosler. This is how well Krugman understood it all, that he at one point interrupted Mosler to better answer a question from um, his, his wife. So from, from Krugman's wife who was asking the question and, and Paul just, you know, absolutely nailed it. So it wasn't a, a question of like, not getting it at the end or not ex even not accepting it, getting it and not accepting it. It was, he got it and he accepted it. Uh, but you wouldn't know that from the statements that he's gone on to make since, uh, including the notion, and this is the big one, is first of all, loanable fund theory we mentioned, but then also the notion that deficit spending raises interest rates. So this is the big one. This is a really big one for the Keynesians and post Keynesians is that well, if, if you increase spending, um, you're going to have to int increase interest rates. Intr it puts positive pressure on interest rates. And we say, well, it's exactly the opposite. It's exactly the opposite. Is that the more government spending you do, the more reserves there are in these member banks' accounts. And so when there are more sellers of reserves than buyers of reserves, because anyone who has 
um, has to any bank has to go and buy reserves because they have inadequate reserves um, are going to uh, is going to push rates down. Whereas if every there are more buyers of reserves than there are sellers of reserves, that's going to raise rates. So if if you are in fact draining reserves, there's fewer and fewer reserves to go around. And so when you have fewer and fewer reserves, if more banks are going to demand reserves to cover their overnight transactions and to cover their cash withdrawals from the vault and just all of the money that they have to keep in, in reserve. Um, and that is going to, to lead to, to higher rates because people are going to be uh, searching for dollars that are harder to get. So that, of course, is going to raise rates. But to hear it from the Keynesians, um, deficit spending has has the effect of actually causing rate changes. And the, the rate is, is a is a Federal Reserve policy tool, um, only it doesn't really work the way that it's not a tool in the way that they think it is. But they do set the target rate and then they have to buy and sell the bonds in order to hit it. So again, when you think about this, it's like, okay, you're going to do all kinds of deficit spending. What that does is it marks up the bank accounts of Federal Reserve member banks. And that in turn means the cost of buying reserves for banks that are in need of reserves goes down or there's a downward pressure. All right. So there's fewer and fewer bonds and more and more reserves. Now, what the Fed will do to hit a higher policy target rate, like when it raises rates, it has to do something to actually get to that new rate. And one of the things it'll do is it'll drain reserves. It'll mm -hmm. sell more bonds or it'll buy back bonds at a higher rate. And that'll push the interest rate of, across the system up. And when it wants to lower rates, what does it do is instead of buying bonds, right? Um, or instead of selling bonds, it buys bonds. So when they lower the rate, what they do is they buy back a bunch of bonds early and pay the full maturation on the bonds. So QE, for example, is one of these um, operations designed to hit for the Federal Reserve to hit its interest rate target. Um, and so what happens is the federal government comes in and does this asset swap and um, it buys up government securities and other securities, which just function, they don't function to change the net assets of the private sector. And the other thing people have to realize is that the spending precedes the issuance of the bonds. The bonds don't finance the spending. We spend and then we issue the bonds. We spend and then we tax. We don't tax and spend. We don't issue the bonds and then spend. The bonds can only function to hit the interest rate target. Hmm. That makes that that makes perfect sense. That's definitely within the constraints uh, of the Federal Reserve Bank. So, hmm. As a side question, and, and this is relevant to what we were talking about with Krugman, why do you think um, so many MMTers uh, gave up uh, Keynes's theory of inflation and how you deal with it, which is direct taxation generally? That's how he preferred, and at least in his early theories, um, for monetarism. Is that just political expedience? What's going on there? No, I think that's a confusion of uh, misunderstanding. I think that comes back to loanable funds theory one, the idea of crowding out um, okay. and that there's only so much money available on loan and that if you deficit spend, it's going to somehow uh, by its very nature, reduce the value of the currency, which then needs to be made more expensive in order um, to maintain its value, uh, which couldn't be further from, from the truth. Like uh, the cost to borrow does not, is not a function of uh, how much deficit spending um, we do in the way that they think uh, it does. So it's the inverse, as I mentioned, when the government increases reserves, uh, 
at the Federal Reserve, it does so by deficit spending. Deficit spending is a reserve ad. That's what the operation is, is it's I'm marking up accounts. So the thing is, when those accounts are marked up, it's for further credit to the final entity. So for example, you're Republic of Varn, I'm the Sam Incorporated, um, you're going to give me $100 million for those widgets. Well, what happens is I have a bank, right? My bank does, does it holds its reserve, my bank's reserves, my checking account is at the Federal Reserve. The, the banks, every bank has a checking account at the Federal Reserve. That's what a reserve account is. It's a checking account for a Federal Reserve member bank, for a commercial bank. And so when you award me that hundred million, my corporation, what you're actually doing is your central bank, your central bank, the Republic of Ireland Central Bank is marking up the account of my company's bank at your central bank. And how do I get the money? Well, what happens is they don't then debit that account at my bank's, um, they don't then debit my bank's account at your central bank in order to put it in my account with my bank. Uh, the San Corporation's account at, we'll say, XYZ Bank, okay? Mm -hmm. What's happening is you're marking up XYZ Bank's reserve account for 100 million. And then XYZ Bank is then depositing those funds into my account. And it's a further credit. It's a credit to my account. It doesn't look that, appear that way to me. I don't care how it ends up in my account. I don't care what it's referred to. I know that it's mine once it hits my account, right? But as far as my bank is concerned, it's further credit. So then what happens to those reserves, right? They're sitting there in XYZ, my bank's account at your central bank. So what does XYZ Bank do with these reserves? Well, they make investments with them. They spend from those reserves. And the problem is then like, well, what happens if the money is no longer in the demand deposits to cover it, their spending from their reserve account? So if, okay, you issued XYZ Bank $100 million for further credit to me, okay, my $100 million in my demand deposit accounts backs that money in the reserve account as long as that's there, whatever spending you do is covered. But then what if I spend some of that money? What if I spend like 10 mil? right? Out of that hundred mil. Okay. So it's a debit from my account at XYZ bank for $10 million. Well, that's going to drop the reserve account of XYZ bank at your central bank by $10 million. Okay. So the assumption was that they well, we must be lending from this reserve account. Like banks must be lending, but we know they can't be lending dollar for dollar. So there has to be some multiplier. So it's like up to 10x, that seems reasonable, that would explain it. Banks must be lending from up to, like, it's like they never talked to any of the bankers. It's like, it's so devoid, it's so detached from actual operational reality. Operational reality is you go into a bank, you ask for a loan. The guy who gives you the loan, is he strokes that loan into existence. So that loan has just created a deposit, right? Because where's the money going? It's going into my checking account at his bank or my checking account at another bank where I do my banking, but I happen to get a loan from this bank, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so what happens then to the bank's reserve account level when it issues a loan? The answer is nothing. Absolutely nothing happens. And I've asked more in this like point blank. I've said, so wait a minute, are all of a bank's reserves reflected by their demand deposits. And he said, well, no, because look at what happens when there's government, when there's bank lending. When your bank lends, it's creating money out of thin air, it creates credit money. In the same way that the federal government creates money via fiat, so do banks when they lend. That's credit money. And all of those, all of those loans create deposits. There's a debit side and an asset side. So they net to zero because they don't cross any sectors. Like when the government spends, that money crosses from the public sector to the private sector. When a bank spends, creates money, that is a horizontal transaction 
right? It's, it stays within a single sector. It doesn't leave the private sector. It's created in the private sector. It stays in the private sector. But when the government spends, and this is why it's called high-powered money, this is why even in other economic schools of thought, it's known as high-powered money, because it's not money that has to, quote, be paid back because it's impossible to borrow money from oneself. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, that's just an accounting fiction when you're borrowing money from oneself, of comp- right. obviously. Right, right. And that's the thing is that this whole thing that we call an economy is really just double entry accounting. It's, it's all it really is on, on some base operational and fundamental level. And so we're keeping track of who has score of what. And at any given moment, we're all competing for whatever net financial assets have been spent in existence. So look, and this applies to third world nations too, because if I look at like the Republic of wherever global South country that has spent however many dollars into existence, I can prove that this also works there. So let's say that since their inception, they've spent whatever, um, just to make the math easy, a million units of their currency. doesn't matter how many years they've been around, but over that period of time of which this political sovereign has existed, they've spent a million units of currency into existence, okay? All right, then the question is, how much debt do they have denominated in their currencies? I subtract that, and then that's the net savings of their entire society in terms of fiscal and fiscal terms. It's not the net wealth of their society. Their net wealth is the real resources they have in the ground human form intellectually scientifically technologically like none of that changes based on the the value or the price of the currency or the value of the currency in relation to other currencies on foreign markets their real wealth their nominal wealth does not change regardless of what the currency does like a carrot is still a carrot a log, you know, a tree used for logging is still a tree used for logging, regardless right. of what. All of these uh, diamonds are still diamonds. It still have, no matter what the currency of the country who possesses this wealth does, there is still some market level value beyond what that um, political sovereign's currency happens to be doing at any given time. But everything that they spent is their national savings minus whatever um bonds that they've issued denominated in another currency so why are they issuing bonds in another currency because they're having trouble getting the stuff that they need in order to build primary goods that's why mm. so you can't if there are many you know global south countries need dollars and euros to get the goods that they'll have a hard time getting without dollars and euros. They don't have purchasing power in their own currency. There isn't demand for their own currency on the FX market, or they have pegged their currency to the dollar or the euro, which is not always a bad choice. Like if you don't quite have the internal infrastructure and capacity to build what you need to build in order to be self-determining, um, and you need euros and dollars in order to get those primary goods to develop your economy, then fine. Being fixed to the euro or the dollar, at least temporarily, may be a wise policy choice so long as you're exporting enough things that people are willing to pay dollars and euros for. If not, then, you know, you have a whole nother set of problems. And, and, either way though, the trick is to avoid becoming a sweatshop for an imperial power Mm -hmm. an economic hegemon throughout this entire game which is also not easy right like china will achieve an even higher degree of monetary sovereignty when they get off of the u.s dollar uh, when they get off of fixing having their currency fixed to the dollar which it currently is but look at the price they paid right the price they paid was in order to achieve that was to be a sweatshop for the united states for decades and decades right that's that's the price that they paid for that uh, will mm-hmm. have paid for that monetary sovereignty. Um, now it doesn't mean that there aren't other ways to do it. It's just going to require global south to global south cooperation. And I highly recommend Fadal Kaboom's work on this for exploring some of the ways in which global south societies can um, sustain greater levels of 
um, monetary sovereignty and increase the fiscal space that they have. The real question, though, is like, are we ultimately just talking about reforms um, or is there real political revolutionary potential in, in any of this? So I talked earlier about how this pulls off the veil when it comes to the affordability question. And it's true everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's just that is the case everywhere, um, including in Europe, which has a unique set of challenges because they gave up their monetary sovereignty. Each of the individual Eurozone states relinquished that when they created the Eurozone. With the advent of the Eurozone, you now have 19 member states with a single central bank. The problem is these are all federal states that all pass federal legislation. That's the problem. In the United States, the states are all currency users. The federal government's a currency issuer. So we have one treasury and one central bank for um, the entire country. And uh, the problem with the Eurozone is you have uh, nine, one central bank and 19 treasuries. And so when the Republic of Greece passes any legislation that requires new funding, it has to go to the European Central Bank under mm -hmm. the European Central Bank's constraints and say, give, give us the money. And the European Central Bank can say, well, no, because it exceeds these levels that we agreed to by treaty that if you exceed, and this usually has to do with um, deficit as a percentage of GDP. If it's more than like, like the rule, and again, the rule is broken all of the time. It's called the 3% rule. If it, mm -hmm. if the new spending being requested exceeds 3% of a country's gross domestic product, uh, the European Central Bank is to not give that country, that Eurozone country, the money. Um, the rule does get broken, but not, not by much. And it, mm -hmm. it obviously imposes a, a kind of like harsh austerity on the countries that most need the money in order to develop their economies and actually fight inflation and maintain price stability while driving toward full employment. Um, and it was a very arbitrary rule, um, like sickeningly arbitrary. Uh, most of the economics profession is soft science as, as uh, best. That's mm -hmm. what drew me to MMT is I so well, if they're right, then this is a new truth in, in scientific empiricism for the field of economics. And it renders a lot of what came before or what was synthesized before. Because the other thing is like MMT isn't particularly new. It's really a synthesis of all of these things that have come before, sectoral balances. Um, it, it's Minsky, uh, it's NAP. Um, it is uh, obviously influenced as well by Marx and uh, maybe not obviously, but it is influenced also by Marx and Keynes heavily. Um, uh, but it's, it's all of these prior observations uh, about the nature of the state in relation to money, what money actually is, sectoral balances, um, functional finance, so Apple Learner, et cetera. Um, having been synthesized into a coherent framework. And I haven't been able to find that includes after several years of challenging this. And I, I got into this through Mark Blythe, who wrote a book called um, Austerity, the History of a Dangerous Idea. Mm -hmm. I was in co conversation and correspondence with Mark Blythe. And Mark said to his eternal credit, you know, what you're asking is really better answered by this school thought over here. And he directed me to a panel discussion between him and Stephanie Kelton uh, at the New School University. It also included a uh, Marxist economist whose name I should know because she was recently on uh, Macro and Cheese with Steve Grumbine over at Real Progressives, who runs a really good econ blog. I think probably the best econ blog that's out there right now is, is Macro and Cheese um, by Steve Grumbine, the uh, founder of the MMT. Um, I'll call grass. They're probably the largest MMT grassroots organization in the U.S. at least. Uh, Real Progressives did a lot of educational outreach. Uh, 
and social media work on MMT. It's been really important to getting this out into the water supply. But I think that ultimately, even if you get this out into the water supply, you're still faced then with the degree to which those in power are going to identify with or not um, the people, constituents that they're supposed to represent. And in countries where capitalism is a more dominant feature of the economy, I think that those political systems are going to be less likely to implement the solutions, the humane solutions, even if they know that they can now afford to do so. Um, one of the things that's interesting, I mentioned earlier about how in Germany under the Third Reich, um, Hitler saw some of these insights that um, come to, to come visible using the, the MMT framework. Um, and we also saw that here as a counterpart with Roosevelt. So mm -hmm. just to tell you, you know, just to give you a sense of uh, ideological counterpart. And I, I, there was, a, look, we moved something like 50% of GDP to the public sector under World War II. And there's absolutely no reason that we couldn't do that again for whatever reason we wanted, and including with price controls. So I would like to see the MMT economists approach unions and say, look, this is what we have to offer in terms of an explanation, one that is more accurate than what you've been told up until this point, which means that in addition to fighting for all of those things that unions typically fight for, you should also be targeting price gouging. You should also mm. be price, targeting price gouging because then it puts the government on its heels to have to answer for price controls. It forced the government to take a position on price controls. And we know the position that the government is going to take, which is no price controls. Even though during World War II, we instituted price controls. We said to GM, just this many airplanes, this many turbine engines, this many of this, this many of that, this many of this. And yes, okay, you will be able to garner a profit for all of this, but it's going to be what we consider a reasonable profit. Now, they could do that. They could do that. But there's no political will for it. And I think that, like you said, that labor discipline, they're not going to, they don't want to give up, especially in the U.S. where capitalism is such a dominant feature of the economy. They don't want to give up that leverage. And price mm -hmm. controls would definitely mean having to give up some leverage versus labor in this country. Well, absolutely. I mean, um, the, the price control element of it is kind of you know, to me, it's a minimum ask um, because it doesn't matter how many raises you. I was actually telling someone about this like early on in this cycle. I was like, look, um, if we have inflation and I'm not going to. And then I was like, I'm not sure what's causing inflation. It might be a bottleneck of sectoral inflation spilling out. It might be a lot of things. But um, if we have inflation and you get a raise. If the prices keep on being gouged and what I'm seeing uh, is that what I saw, what I think happened was, was cost push plus opportunity. So you start right. having some, some, some legitimate cost push inflation come up in different sectors and then everybody responds. And then you start getting a cycle of competition up on price gouging because, well, if one sector is gouging or if one sector is pushing up, there's another. And then uh, if you go to the store, for example, and there's, bird flu and so uh you you have a price increase on chicken and eggs well then all the other meats are going to go up including eventually cheap meats like pork um yeah. and, and that's not because they need to or have to it's not it's not it's because they can like it's because yeah. it's created the appearance that this is a it creates an opportunity that was not there where where before that opportunity, like firms are going to be hesitant to do that because it's going to be obvious what they're doing. Right. Um, um, and 
Uh, if we just fight for yeah, better working conditions, all that stuff costs money. Don't get me wrong; I'm not against it. But if all we're fighting for is raises, and we're still getting price gouged, right. the raises don't matter. Right. So um, I said, yeah, and and the idea on the, the price gouging side is well, whatever price I can clear stock in, right? So it, where is it easiest to price gouge? It's easiest to price gouge with necessary goods and services that's right. where it's easiest so i mean that's why you see it with like uh, food. energy energy yeah, food, and housing food and energy yeah it's the easiest places because it's like well you kind of have to pay whatever price i set because you can't live without these things so that's where it always happens first and it's never a surprise you know and you can't entirely blame it on uh energy uh, costs like yes, energy costs, especially oil, are going to affect crude is going to affect the price of, of food for sure. Not only because of transportation, but because of the cost of uh, fertilizer, pesticides, etc. It's all petroleum based, um, and, and all of the other ways that we know of where the cost of crude is embedded into the cost of production. So yes, that's there's that, but there's also the fact that like. Capital knows what a necessity versus a, versus a desire good that isn't necessary uh, is. Like they, they understand what those are, and, and and they're going to exploit that their advantage to their profit advantage every chance they get. I mean that's the nature of capital. So um, that's the reason for existence is profit. Yeah. So we can't expect them to somehow decide not to act in accordance with their, their own self-interest within that kind of a system. Um, it would be foolish to, to think otherwise. So, but then you run into the ideological and cultural um, ideas of it being un-American or socialist or communist or something to institute price controls. And so part of that cultural indoctrination, that attitude that's viewed throughout U.S. Um, consciousness politically also prevents and makes it easier for any um, administration not to institute price controls. Do I think that like a Sanders administration would? Yes, I do. But I think that's probably where it starts. I don't think anything to the quote unquote right of a Sanders of anything, like even a, a hair to the right of a Sanders type administration would um, fight for or implement uh, price controls. I don't think that would be on the, that would not be on the table. To the level or degree that you like, starting with a Sanders type, uh, Sanders type ideology, I think that's when you would start to see price controls. From that point left, is when you would start to see price controls on, on the table. Um, and again, all of this is is just a function of of demand. So, is there a better way to distribute goods and services? Um, does MT kind of key us into just how inefficient the system can be, and then also the limits of efficiency? I, I think I think it does. Like I think we see the limits of efficiency under um, having capitalism as a feature of the economy to any degree. I, I think it highlights MMT uh, very much highlights the weaknesses um, of capitalism, actually, and what the limitations are. And also shows us that everything is already planned. Like no matter how much um, we like to think otherwise, especially with the so-called like free market dogmas, everything is already planned. Like who is going to provide what service and to what extent? The private sector, the public sector, what we can expect private sector wages to be. When Biden, right after the uh, I, I always reticent and hesitant to call it a lockdown because for me it was there was never a lockdown, at least not in the U.S. But we'll say the COVID restrictions, the business. What do you want to say? The business, like businesses being shuttered during COVID. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't. That period, um, you know, demonstrated more than anything else that investment is really a function of, of demand it's obvious right. and, and somehow that has been lost on many 
contemporary contemporary here in the now Marxists that like capital firms produce when they're it's profitable to do so that's when they produce there's no other reason for them to produce um and that even if there is sufficient demand but let's say i don't know let's just say hypothetically that for whatever reason they refuse to produce with when there is sufficient investment right or excuse me, when there's sufficient demand let's say for whatever reason private firms refuse to produce they refuse to invest in production to meet the increased aggregate demand in the system. Okay, well, the government can buy uh, whatever services and labor it wants at any price. And so to get back to what I was saying that got me on this track, when after the pandemic, uh, the restrictions were lifted, Biden came out, and we talked about this last time, and he set a $15 minimum for all federal contractors. Almost overnight, the lowest paying jobs in the economy became $15 an hour mm-hmm. without without the federal government having changed minimum wage laws. So the minimum federal wage is still $7.25, yet everybody's paying $15 an hour. This is not a coincidence. It was right after Biden decided that the minimum they were going to pay federal contractors was $15. Did we see a reflection of this throughout the private sector which is now paying more than 15. why because it's now competing with the public sector job being job that's open to almost anyone being 15 dollars an hour so really right now and this is the other sad this is sad but true but also an important insight if you want to look at where the like real minimum wage is you have to look at what um, enlisted uh, personnel in the U.S. Army, absolutely, you know, the, the grunts of the grunts who sign up, what they're getting paid. That sets the price level for labor for the rest of the economy more than anything else as an absolute minimum. Um, and it's probably just under, I would imagine, the, the $15 federal contractor rate it's probably a little bit lower. It's probably a little bit lower than that. It might be a little bit higher. It's probably just over it or just under it. I don't know. You, um, I'm guessing that if it's 15 for federal contractors, U.S. Army personnel are probably doing 14 and change or 15 and change. Um, so mm-hmm. also not a coincidence. It sets a reference price for the rest of the economy. So by pure market force alone, you have this, de facto minimum wage that has risen dramatically, dramatically, despite the fact that the minimum wage law hasn't changed at all. So it's another piece of empirical evidence to support MMT's claims. Uh, uh, Yeah, I think that's been backed up. If you study the Nordic countries, most of them don't even have formal minimum wage laws like we do. That's uh, more of a France, Germany sort of thing. Because they don't need them, because either the government or the union or the union set contract rate will set the price. And exactly. they set it at about a living rate, about twenty-seven, twenty-eight dollars an hour. Um, and that's even at like McDonald's. Um, you know, not an ideal system from my point of view, but it is a much better system. Um and it does prove a lot of your points. I mean, uh the, the the large i mean it, it also makes total sense because even from an economics perspective on this point uh, we might disagree on the fine details on certain commodities but on labor the largest purchaser of labor is the federal government what the federal government sets as labor price will be the market price because if you um like i'm always like well you know the largest employer in the in the US is like the military the state like schools um state-run hospitals a municipal this or that and anything that gets a federal contract and then most of the municipal stuff is going to come close to the federal contract almost instantly uh because they don't want to have to compete with the with the feds for their same workforce um and then it goes out from there because um particularly in a labor market like we have right now um but in general uh, the largest purchaser is going to be able to do price setting. I mean, like that's that makes perfect fucking sense. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so it yeah, I mean, it's mm -hmm. not a coincidence that the people who own the country in this country and in most countries are the people who are in the privileged position vis-a-vis -vis the state. And that privileged position, as we talked about earlier, is being the first to receive government funds when new spending occurs mm -hmm. so that you are earmarked to be the first person to receive new spending and by first person i really mean first business entity to receive those funds so that's the privileged position as is the rentier class landlords which the government is also in a sense subsidizing or at least supporting the market dynamics that keep rents going up it's the same cycle the real estate market works like an nft market in the sense that people are trading up this commodity for higher and higher and higher value and as this as they continue to sell the property and they continue to sell the property for higher and higher uh, values, somebody else's income has to support a higher price. And in the case of the real estate market, that higher and higher price, every time it changes hands, is supported by rents until rents can no longer support, uh, until incomes can no longer support higher rents. And that's the other problem is you see the price gouging right now on rents throughout every major city in the United States pretty much. And it's property values going up as a result of people selling for higher and higher amounts of money, this property. Um, and then turning around, oftentimes in instances where certain units are kept off the market by design to keep in prices inflated. So in Boston, for example, there are 10,000, I think it's 12,000 now, um units of housing that are available that are empty but not on the market hmm, yeah now, now, now think about that so that's that's investors foreign and domestic who say i'm going to buy this piece of property but i'm not going to rent it and what that does is it creates a supply problem right it creates what real estate agents would call low inventory so that creates an inventory problem, which then raises the property values of those properties and all of the other ones that are actually being rented. So they could engage in a cartel-like behavior if they wanted to. You could have entire development companies get together and say, we're gonna leave these 3,000, those 2,000, these 500, whatever units off the market so that prices of the actual property go up and when they do that we can charge more rent but they may have already paid the actual mortgage uh off on these things i mean it could be just pure profit that they're collecting each month but in any case what they are collecting each month is always almost an excess of their cost of ownership right which is whatever mortgage they still have to pay probably insurance and like water and sewage and not even in all cases right so the government through a legal a series of legal constructs and actually it's noam chomsky references this alludes to this it's says you know you read the federalist papers and i have uh john jay had it straight the people who own the cup the country ought to govern it um and that's that is the outlook and that is the devised set of political institutions and the way that they communicate and coordinate and interact with one another that where we see the results of this very American ethos. So we have to keep that in mind that we're in a country where all of this is being done. The economic system is being run under a certain ethos. And it's that ethos of the people who own the country uh, ought to govern it. And I don't think that you're going, you know, this fight for a return to a Roosevelt-esque sympathetic political establishment, uh, 
even if we could achieve it, I don't think there is enough time for it. And who would spearhead it in the U.S.? Like AOC? I mean, I'm, I'm honestly asking, like, where would it come from? You know, it's certainly not going to come from like a Gavin Newsom or um, I'm trying to remember or you know, Pete Buttigieg or any of these other guys who've recently been floated as contenders for 2024. So. And we see the Biden doing exactly the thing that could lead to serious political and economic turmoil over the next two years, because absolutely nothing was going to get done in terms of new spending except the military for two years. That's mm -hmm. the only new spending you see, maybe some infrastructure, right? Um, because that's all the Republicans in the House are going to sign off on. So where does that leave the country? It leaves us in a stagnant position that could very well lead to <clears throat> recession. And the only thing that's needed to prevent that is for Biden to spend adequately enough and to target these supply chain and supply side cost, cost push issues, issues which he can do with new spending and how do you know when you've spent enough well it's up to the point of runaway inflation inflation's coming inflation is going to end if it hasn't already um and it may have already but what people need to understand is that when inflation ends prices don't come down mm -hmm. okay, they just totally. stop going up they stop going up inflation's over when prices stop continuing to continuously rise the inflation's not over when prices come down it's over when prices stop going up so people need to understand that where we're at is where we're going to stabilize at for a while with the exception of oil what we might see is the price at the pump hopefully can come down but don't expect that prices across the board will then also come down. What will happen is prices across the board will stop going up. This will be a new price baseline, the new normal, and it'll stop increasing. And then you'll know that inflation is over. Inflation being over does never means in any sense by any school of economic thought that prices will come down. Prices coming down is deflation, okay? Right. Um, so I don't, do not expect Biden's economic policies um, over the next two years to be recession mitigating. They won't be, even though he thinks that they are. They will not be recession mitigating. Um, and do not expect um, unemployment numbers to remain great, except insofar as we can continue to expand credit Mm -hmm. viably without causing a kind of um, credit bubble. Now, if the Fed continues to insist on high, con continues to insist on hiking interest rates or even just maintaining high rates, uh, that is going to really hurt investment because the private sector is not getting adequate enough federal dollars, new high powered money into the system in order to increase national savings in order to support demand like as long as you have elevated demand if that demand can't be realized because people don't have the money that they need in order to realize that demand uh then they're going to turn to credit and once they can no longer afford the credit or once incomes are no longer great enough or keep up with rising interest rates enough to support people um continuing to borrow in order to spend, then you're left with a recession. And that's where we could be potentially uh, heading. Now, whether or not it'll happen while he's still in office or like immediately after he leaves, or right before inauguration is you know to be determined. But what he needs to do is open the spigot and, and start spending to adequate levels until unemployment goes down because we still have unemployment in the system. And right. that is, that's an MMT fundamental, is how do I know that we're not spending at adequate levels? How do I know the deficit's not big enough? I know it because there is some combination of either not enough, I don't see any inflation 
and or there's unemployment. So I yes, I see inflation right now, but I also see unemployment. And when I examine the inflation, I see that it's mostly coming from the supply side and from price gouging at this point. Mm -hmm. So I know that that's not an aggregate demand problem. Um, and when I see that there's still unemployment, I know that is an aggregate demand problem. If I alleviate the aggregate demand problem, if I'm able to satisfy the level of aggregate demand that people want, because again, when I'm handing these out, when I'm turning litter into currency, I have to issue enough to one, satisfy the tax that I'm imposing, and two, satisfy any demand for savings. And savings for what? Well, savings so that you can use a portion of these tax credits to buy food at the grocery store, to fill your car with gas, to have a car, to pay your rent, to do whatever it is. So the federal government's job is to not only satisfy the imposed, issue enough currency to satisfy the imposed tax liability, but also issue enough to satisfy the demand for savings, which is used to spend on life's everyday necessities and to keep investment going. Because if people don't have that, those excess dollars, and I say excess to mean in excess of what the amount that's required to pay the tax liability, uh, then there is no production. There is no, there is no aggregate demand for production. That makes perfect sense. All right. Well, thank you for coming on and, and breaking this down. Um, I think you made a pretty decent argument for, for why this is important. Um, uh, I guess the last question I'm going to ask um, is that given that we know what the Democrats are likely to do um, and we, and I think we see, we've seen both their stance on labor and their stance on general austerity um, despite words to the compromise. And I realize that individuals, politicians may have in different stances, but we're talking aggregate here. Um, where do you see the p new political threats coming, particularly since the Democrats seem to feel like they're in safe mode after this midterm when they did not lose as bad as they thought they were going to lose? Yeah, so I, I think there's a serious threat from uh, Christian nationalism coming from a DeSantis-Pence uh, alliance that could emerge DeSantis as the candidate uh, with Mike Pence as the, the running mate. Um, we have to remember that Donald Trump was well read and had on his bedside Hitler's essays, which I presume also included some of those economic writings that I referenced earlier. And so it comes no, as no surprise to me that Donald Trump spent at levels adequate enough to basically have a near full employment economy. Uh, but it did it with a sort of nationalist, proto-fascist flair in that, yes, we had a near full employment economy, but those earning the least were always often people of color and other marginalized members of the society. And that, that level of precarity for those that he would find most threatening um, was by design. Uh, so it's a full employment economy, but very specifically tailored to ensuring that the most challenging or undesirable jobs, um, the most challenging in the sense that there's some of the most undesirable jobs, or at least the most precarious jobs, were going to the most vulnerable people in society who had no opportunity for a, a leg up otherwise. That is an example of how MMT insights can be used in the service of a nationalist agenda is the way that Donald Trump used those insights. That's not to say that Donald Trump was familiar with MMT, but was familiar with enough of the central crux, which is the the nation as the currency issuer, the government as the public monopolist of the currency. Donald Trump did understand that insight. 
And he used it to great effect to create an economy of almost no unemployment. Now that doesn't make a quote good economy, but you had price stability and you had near near full employment. It doesn't mean it was quality employment. It doesn't mean that there wasn't rampant exploitation of workers. It doesn't mean that unions weren't attacked or that union power wasn't in jeopardy or at risk. It doesn't mean that workers were getting a fair shake. It doesn't mean that there was any greater control over one's work life. It just means that from macro indicators, these sort of insights can be used to create what in aggregate terms is a quote unquote good economy from the standpoint of price stability and full employment. Uh, but just to do it in a way that has a very nationalist, fascist, authoritarian flavor and character to it. And that's what Donald Trump was able to do. So that worries me when wielded by Republicans who have a similar, and I don't think that a DeSantis Pence um, type government would, would be that far removed from the kinds of Trump policies that we saw. They would just have a different tone uh, and style but I think we would see something similar. I mean, Republicans throughout the last, since really the late 70s, early 80s, um, have better um, managed the economy through what, uh, through an MMT lens, we would say that they've done a better job of, of managing the economy because they realized whether they admitted it publicly or not, and they never did, and they never would. The deficits don't matter, at least not in the way that we, we've um, been come, or at least not in the way that we've come to, to think that they do over the course uh, of the neoliberal period that really began um, with the crisis under Carter with OPEC and the monitors taking over is because it was their time. They saw an opportunity where their explanation could be accepted. Um, and so they, they struck with that. And I think in MMT land, we're not doing a great job of taking advantage of the times that we're in. Uh, this is a time where we should be reaching out to Lula in Brazil. There should be emissaries. There should be ambassadors talking to him where we can demonstrate just how well this stuff works when policies are that are implemented economically are MMT informed, regardless of the degree to which capitalism is a feature of the economy. And from my preferences as an anarchist, obviously that would be as little as possible. Um, something we can talk about more on a future episode that I'll leave as kind of a cliffhanger is a little bit more about how, and I've alluded to some of it and I talked about some of the ways in which why, because I think that this is so threatening to structures of national power, state power, um, but also in other ways in the future, we could talk about how someone who is work abolitionist against all forms of remuneration, and by work abolitionist, I'm defining work as forced work, mm -hmm. uh, is what I have in mind, uh, but also against the use of currency money, uh, and I say use of, I mean, in a the society that I would envision wanting to live in, there would be no money, there would be no forced work, there would be no remuneration for work. All these things would be abolished along with the state and, of course, capitalism. But we'll, we'll expound yes. on that a little bit more in the future. Yeah, I think that's another episode, but definitely. All right. Thank you so much for coming on, Sam. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Take care.